I guess that other camera's not working. That's okay. Let's see if we show up on the YouTubes. I think we got some latency. There we go. Hello, and welcome to another live stream. Basically, in this one, we're just going to be doing some Q&A. I have some questions that were coming up on the comments section of some of the videos, and I've just been too lazy to type out an answer. So, um, that's what we're doing in this video. So, let's go ahead and get to it. First question is from... Sorry, stuff's popping up on my screen. First question is from... Grinder Singh, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. This was actually on the uh, community website, and again, this was one that they asked a question, and I think I read it and I answered it in my head, but I forgot to actually type out an answer, so I'm sorry that I didn't get to your answer for like a week. I was going home and doing stuff with my dad, and there was stuff going on with the dog, but anyway, about a week ago, uh, I, we got this question... A very good question. I'm trying to understand what the yin, yang, blood, qi, and jing of an organ is. For example, we say kidney yin, kidney yang, kidney qi, kidney jing. We could say spleen qi deficiency or spleen yang or yin deficiency. Each one of those has its own signs and symptoms, but I'm trying to understand what the yin, yang, blood, and qi and jing of an organ is. I hope it makes sense. Yes, that's a question that um, people ask a lot because even just when we talk about qi, we have a lot of different types of qi and people are like, what's the difference when we say all these, all these things? So first of all, I should probably say that I'm kind of just pulling this answer out of my ass. I don't really have a good classical uh, reference for this, but this is just my interpretation of how to think about these things. And if somebody more scholarly or with more classical knowledge wants to say that there's a better way or that I'm wrong, that's totally fine. This is just my way of thinking about it. But basically, my view on this is chi is chi. There's one chi flowing throughout the body. It flows through all the channels. It's supplying nourishment to all the organs and tissues of the body. So to some extent, chi is just chi. There's only one chi in the body. However, we call that chi by different names depending on where it is and what it's doing. So when chi is in the channels, we call it channel chi. When chi is in the organs, we call it organ chi. Um, sometimes we even use the term yang chi. Like when we talk about guajir, we say guajir unblocks the yang chi. And people are like, wait, what is yang chi? Now we have another type of chi. And it turns out yang chi is just chi in the body that happens to be performing a yang function at that time, that it's warming or moving upward or doing something yang in nature, so we call it yang qi. Um, qi in the chest is called chest qi, so it's just kind of like qi is qi, and we can call it different things based on where it is. I think maybe an analogy here is like water. Water is water. Water is H2O. All water is dihydrogen monoxide. Um, all water has similar properties. However, we can call water different things based on where it is. When water is falling from the sky, we call that rainwater. When water is underground, we call that groundwater. When water is in your bathtub, we call that bath water. And so to some extent, water is water, but that water will act differently depending on where it is and what it's doing. So rainwater has different properties than groundwater. Groundwater is very slow moving, whereas lake water is very fast and, and rushing, whereas swamp water is kind of smelly. Um, but it's all water, and so we just call it by different names depending on where it is. Um, and so... I think maybe that's one way to think about it. Maybe another way is uh, Lonnie Jarrett likes to use this analogy of a household that suppose you have a household that's trying to run harmoniously. You have one person in charge of the cooking the food, one person in charge of taking out the trash. Maybe we can borrow this analogy and say that maybe chi is like electricity. Uh, technically, every room in your, like, hopefully in the West, most, most people, they have electricity in their entire house. But the electricity is going to do different things in different rooms. So if the electricity goes out in your kitchen, you're going to have different problems versus if the electricity goes out in your bedroom. So if the electricity goes out in your kitchen, it's like you got 
kitchen electricity deficiency, and you'll have certain signs and symptoms associated with that. You won't be able to cook the food, your refrigerator won't work, blah, blah, blah. Whereas if the electricity goes out in your bathroom, you'll have different problems that you can't see to put on your makeup, you can't run your blow dryer. So electricity is electricity, but we can call it different things. We can call it kitchen electricity versus bathroom electricity. And when the electricity goes out in just one place, you're going to experience different problems. I don't know if that made more if that made sense or if that just made it more confusing. Um, but so when it comes to the organs, it's uh, you have chi throughout your entire body, just like you have electricity throughout your entire house. But the chi can go to different organs and do different things. And so when the chi is in the spleen, we call it spleen chi. When the chi is in the lung, we call it lung chi. Same thing with blood. You hopefully you have blood going to all of your organs. But when blood is in the liver, we call it liver blood. When blood is in the heart, we call it heart blood. Sometimes all the organs don't have all the things. For example, like there's, there's really no such thing as lung blood. Like you would never have the diagnosis of lung blood deficiency. So technically there's blood nourishing the lung organ, but there's really no such thing as lung blood. So I guess if we go back to the house analogy, that would be like most people have water and plumbing in their kitchen, and most people have water in their bathroom, most people don't have water in their bedroom. You don't have like a, a, a bedroom sink or a bedroom faucet. So it's kind of like if you got too much water in your kitchen and your kitchen is flooding, it's like, oh, you have excess kitchen water. Or you have if the water is not working in your bathroom and your toilet won't flush, you have bathroom water deficiency. Uh, it's it's going to be pretty weird if you have water in your bedroom because most people don't have plumbing in their bedroom. So it's kind of the same thing where it's like there's no such thing as lung blood deficiency or things like that. Some of those get pretty controversial because, like, I would say there's no such thing as spleen blood. However, when we look at Machio Chizangfu patterns, he does have a pattern called spleen blood deficiency. But if you actually read the section, he admits that it's not actually spleen blood, it's spleen chi deficiency leading to blood deficiency because the spleen can't form the blood. Is there such a thing as spleen yin deficiency? Some people say yes, some people say no. So sometimes that gets a little bit weird. Um, what was the original question? Uh, can yin, can yang, can you owe? What's the different ones? Yeah, so it's just if you have yin in an organ, like yin is yin, but if you have yin in an organ, we call it kidney yin or heart yin or things like that. And because that it's one yin, but because it's doing different things and different organs, we're going to get different signs and symptoms. And then we can have all over chi deficiency. It's like maybe in your house, the electricity a fuse blows and you just have electricity going out in your kitchen and now you have kitchen electricity deficiency. Or maybe you throw a breaker or something goes wrong with the wiring and you just have bathroom electricity deficiency. But maybe the power goes out and you have all over house deficiency. It says, and then everything's broken. Same thing, you can have all over chi deficiency. Um, you can have all over blood deficiency, or we can say it's just the blood in a particular organ that's deficient, or it's just the yang in a particular organ that's excess, but it's really all the same. And again, it goes beyond just organs. We can talk about channel chi, organ chi, yang chi, chest chi, all these different, all these, all the types of chi. So, but it's really just chi. They're just in different areas doing different things. I feel like I had more in my head about that, but... That's an answer for now. Hopefully that's helpful. If not, I think I wrote something up on the community website. Ooh, this is interesting. A few times I heard about three Zhao disconnection, but I never learned it. Is there a thing? Is there a way to reconnect them? No, I've never heard of that. I'll have to look that up and um, see what it is. Because sometimes we talk about yin and yang disconnecting. Sometimes we talk about things not communicating properly, but in terms of the three jiao disconnected. Um, I haven't heard of that. David is asking, if you were in first year TCM school, what books would you read? Also, could you explain the difference between qi stagnation and blood stagnation? Boop, 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 boop. Um... 
books to read if you're just starting out I would keep it simple Do, 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 do. If you go to tcmstudy.net, does my internet work? It does. Book recommendations, it does. I don't have it listed here. I was going to say, what am I thinking of? The web that has no weaver. This is the one we usually recommend to people starting out. Uh, this is kind of a good overview. This is written by Ted Kapchuk. He's done a lot of um, this. I think this is the second edition of this book. He kind of wrote this book when he he went to China and studied in China, and then kind of brought his experiences back to the West. And uh, I think he's updated it since then. Um, and so that and it kind of explains some of the basics and some of the basic theory of TCM. Uh, 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 and I feel like. I found a place where you could download a PDF, and it was this, and a, like a school linked to this PDF, and so I'm not sure if that's legal or not. So I'm I'm not sure if that was like an authorized copy to get a PDF or not, or if that was just somebody pirated it and this and this like school linked to it. But it, it could be the case that if you type in web that has no Weaver PDF, you'll be able to download it. Um, but it's a good book. These other ones recommended here, uh, Between Heaven and Earth, that's one that I first read when I was in India. Um, this is, it's, it's like a cheap book and it's pretty good. I think a lot of people like this. I remember not liking it quite as much. It used some weird analogies to the, the five phases and different archetypes and like a, it's like a wizard and a warrior. I, I wasn't too into that, but other people are into it. So that's another one just to get, the, this one is more for a, a lay person. But um, those are some common books we recommend. Uh, the other things we get into, um, the other book I really like is this Applied Channel Theory by Wang Yi. but that one I might say is better for after you've gone through your first year of uh, channels and points. Spark and Machine is another one. It's not really real. It's not really like a TCM thing, but it's kind of trying to explain TCM in Western terms using fascia and things like that. So that's that's an interesting one. You can, if you sign up for an Audible trial, you can uh, get it for free. So that's an interesting book, but I won't say it's going to like help you pass any tests or anything like that. Um, but usually, Web that has no Weaver is the main one we talk about. Other than that, I don't, other than that, I don't know. It's kind of like follow along in your classes and usually once you get through a year or two then once you have some foundations then you can kind of broaden into other books and uh, that are more specific topics but you need some sort of foundational understanding first um yeah so if you just finish first year then you can probably read things like oh the Wang Yi applied channel theory book and now that's kind of a good refresher and kind of goes through some of the stuff about point categories channel theory stuff like that that can be a good refresher um mm, 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 mm. and then it's like you can get into like sp specific topics like if you want to learn more about divergent channels and somebody wrote a book just about divergent channels if you want to learn just about the eight extras and i think uh mikishima wrote a book about the eight extraordinary channels if you're interested in certain topics like emotional uh treating psycho-emotional disturbances i think Machi Ocha, before he passed away, uh, published a book about uh, Shen problems and things like that. So you can get so you can get into specific topics after that too. But for something general like web that has no lever is a good general one. Alex, Alex is from San Diego. Hi, I think your weather is a lot nicer than it is here. It's been in the 90s in Colorado, and I looked in San Diego, and it's like 70s, looks perfect. Um. Which side to needle when treating muscle problems? Bilateral, opposite, unilateral. Different people have different opinions on this and different styles will do different things. If it's, um, if it's a muscle thing and you're able to go into it, I would just go directly into it on the same side. Um, if it's 
usually I would use the opposite side if there's some condition where I can't stick needles in the area. Like if their ankle is so swollen that you just there's no room to stick needles in, or if they have an open wound, there's no room to stick needles in. If it's covered in a cast or a bandage and you can't and you physically can't needle the area, then I would go to the opposite side. Um, I had somebody wasn't Bell's palsy, trigeminal neuralgia. I had a patient with trigeminal neuralgia, and um, I was very worried that he said that any kind of just like touching that area or even if his clothes rubbed up against it, that it could cause a flare-up. So I was really worried about needling on into that area that I might inadvertently cause his symptoms to flare up. So I needled on the opposite side. Um, I would say if it's a specific, if I'm going for like trigger points, uh, trying to release muscles, I would just go into the one side uh, on the same side. Whereas if it was more systemic points, I would usually go bilaterally. So if it was like a um, person had elbow pain, my personal thing, um, if they had tennis elbow, I would do local points on the same side. But if I wanted to do other um, just moving qi and blood in the yangming channels, maybe I would do LI4 on both sides. Or if I wanted to relax the tendons, I would do GB34 on both sides. So the systemic things I would do bilaterally. The local asher points I would only do on one side. But again, everybody has different uh, different opinions on that. So it kind of depends on what works best for you. Should I needle the injured side or it's not a good practice? Again, it kind of depends on um, what's going on. If it was tennis elbow, I would stick needles in there and ease them. If it was um, a bacterial infection, I might stay away from it. Um, Sometimes, like other, other certain things, you can do surround the dragon and needle around it, but not actually needle into it. But... Um, I feel like most sports injury type things, I would I, I would have no problem needling the same side. So basic things like sciatica, knee pain, stuff like that. Boop, 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 boop. Okay, other questions from the from the YouTube comments. Josh Cohen is asking, "Hi Nicholas, you said that LI11 doesn't treat constipation, but." My first ever acupuncture treatment out of two tr so far, my practitioner told me that putting pressure on LI11, she didn't say, but that's what she was pointing to, uh, can putting pressure on LI11 can help constipation. I'm curious your reflection on this. Also, thank you, future student. Awesome. So yeah, this was on. This was a comment on. I think it was not on the large intestine channel. It was actually a comment on. Um, the point category video. And so kind of my initial reaction to this, uh, because I'm mean and pretentious, like my initial reaction to this is be like, would be like, well, your acupuncturist is wrong. Sorry, bro. Um, and I think this is a thing that happens a lot in the West that P that not, we don't really learn very strongly the difference between the organs and the channels. So when I say LI11 doesn't treat constipation, that's kind of emphasized the idea that points on the large intestine channel treat channel problems, not organ problems. So the large intestine channel starts at the index finger, goes up the arm, wraps around the mouth, and then goes to the eye. So the large intestine channel is good for treating problems along the arm, like tennis elbow, things in the shoulder. It's good for clearing a lot of heat, but when we say clearing heat, we're, we mean clearing heat from the channel. So we see a lot of toothache, red face, eye problems, swollen ears. That's clearing heat from the channel, which is different from clearing heat from the organ. So when I say that LI11 doesn't treat constipation, it's kind of em to emphasize that fact that uh, large intestine points treat the large intestine channel, which is different from the large intestine organ. However, to make sure that I wasn't being too much of a jerk, I did go and investigate this a little bit further. And it turns out if you look at the Machiocha Gold, the Practice of Chinese Medicine, that's a, this is a book where he lists things out by syndrome. So if you go into the chapter in constipation, it turns out that Machiocha does use LI11 as a point for constipation due to heat. It also turns out if you go to the Fisher Wu book, uh, Applied Therapeutics and 
treatment principles and uh, the book by Fisher Wu that's read on the cover. If you go to the chapter on constipation, it turns out for heat pattern constipation, they also use LI11 to treat constipation. And so to some extent, yeah, you could say that LI11 treats constipation. You could have an argument from that, but really I think it's just that LI11 is a really good heat clearing point. And so Machiocha even uses it to clear liver heat. Um, the Yangming channel is full of qi and blood, so it tends towards heat and excess. So LI11 is really good for clearing heat. And that if you have heat in the large intestine organ, it's very likely that that heat will spill over into the large intestine channel and you'll end up with symptoms of channel heat as well. So that's why that pattern has things like red face and other stuff that it's heat going into the channel. However, I would still stand by my statement just that um, if you go through Deadman, you'll find, first of all, he very much emphasizes this point that um, the points on the large intestine channel treat the, or treat the channel, not the organ. He mentions this several times throughout his chapter on the large intestine channel. But if you go through Deadman, there is only one point on the arm that's indicated for constipation, and that is Sanjiao 6. So if you go through all the points, you won't see any other point on the arm that has constipation listed as indication. So if you look at Deadman, does LI11, does it list constipation as an indication? No. If you go into Machiocha Silver and go through the points, uh, LI11, does he list it uh, constipation as an indication? No. If you go into CAM, third edition, second or third edition, and you go under LI11 and you look at its list of indications, it has things like red face, toothache, heat in the face, does it list constipation? No. So from an from a acupuncture point perspective, LI11, it's not listed as an indication in, in any of our books, but if treatment-wise, if a person has constipation and you needled LI11, I think that wouldn't necessarily be wrong, but I would still go to other, like it wouldn't be my top choice. I think that if you have um, constipation, you're much more likely to use points that affect the organ itself, points like stomach 25, the front moo, or even spleen 15, which is right next to it, UB25, the back shoe point of the large intestine, or stomach 37, the lower for the C point. Also interesting to point out that when we talk about the, the treatment of constipation, when we go to those books and look, look at the constipation chapter, LI11 only appears in the pattern for large intestine heat. It does not appear in the patterns for constipation due to qi stagnation, constipation due to yin deficiency, constipation due to blood deficiency, constipation due to qi deficiency. LI11 does not appear there. There we use points like stomach 25, UB25, stomach 37. So, so if we want to say LI11 treats constipation, it's only for patterns of constipation due to heat because LI11 is a heat clearing point. I'd also say that just clinically, usually when I see constipation, that's usually constipation due to blood deficiency or yin deficiency. And so that's also why I like, I might add it in at the end just as an extra point, LI4, LI11, something like that. But usually when I see constipation, it's due, to, it's due to like yin or blood deficiency. And usually it's a lot easier to treat it with herbs. So that's what I, that's what I do. So, so I guess uh, that's me being pretentious. I, I shouldn't say that your acupuncturist is completely wrong because there, you can support this idea that LI11 does treat constipation because we do see it show up in certain point prescriptions for constipation due to heat. But from a st strictly from a point perspective, if we look in Deadman, if we look in Machiocha, if we look in Cam, constipation is not listed as one of the indications for that point. So I hope I hope that was helpful, and I hope I just didn't sound like a pretentious jerk because I tend to do that a lot of times. Quadology channel. Oh, sorry, I hope I didn't just clip my microphone. Quadology Channel it says, I hate to be that guy, but, um, uh, what was the point of the lady being half naked? Great question. So, this is in reference to the point location videos. I think this was specifically on the Lung Channel video. And the lady in question, her name is Tiffany. She's a very nice lady. She's a, a personal trainer in San Diego. So if you need personal training, uh, look her up. 
Uh, I don't know. I think this is kind of funny. I think I think the real story behind this was I was like, I want to do a point location video for the lung channel. The lung channel, I need access to like your upper chest so we can find your sternomanubrial R uh, angle, and we need to get to your shoulder to do lung one. And I just kind of thought she would like wear a tank top or a sleeveless shirt or something, and she was like, eh, I'll just wear a bikini top, and that way you can get to everything you need to. And I was like, okay. And I didn't think much of it. Um, and so to me, that just seemed completely normal because in school, when we do our year-end exams for point locations, that's how our models dress. That's how we instruct them to dress, is that the men are usually wearing shorts and are just shirtless. The women are wearing shorts and a bikini top, and that way everybody can get to all the points that they need to without anything getting in the way, without having to move things out of the way. So to me, it just seemed completely normal, and I didn't think anything of it. Um, Apparently, uh, this upsets a lot of people, especially people from India have been leaving me a lot of uh, comments about the fact that uh, there's a half-naked lady in the videos. And I thought it was kind of funny, because when I, well, like, like there was one comment when I first read it, I thought this person was offended by the fact that there was uh, a, a woman in the video and that seemed inappropriate to them but after I after I reread the comment a couple times it's, it's really more that they were mad at me they thought that I was taking advantage of the woman in the video and that I was like creeping on her and being like oh you need to come and not wear a shirt um so yeah lady in the video her name is Tiffany her uh, girlfriend fiance I think they're engaged now her fiance is is Mallory uh, she was in the room they they would both come together. She was in the room while we were recording. Uh, neither one of them had a problem with it. I didn't have a problem with it. I think it's kind of funny that other people seem to have a problem with it. And I just think it's funny because as a medical professional, you're going to have to deal with bodies. And some of those bodies are going to be in various states of undress. And so you have to have a professional attitude about it. So I think it's kind of funny that people make such a big deal out of it. And when none of the, I don't know, none of us did. So it kind of reminds me of uh, in school when we would learn, uh, we would learn how to needle Ren 1, which is in the taint between the genitals and the anus. And so when we, when we go through our needle technique classes, we would needle every point. So we would needle points along the eye, points next to the arteries, and we would also needle Ren 1 and do 1. And I remember there were some people that were like, oh, when we get to that, I'm just not going to come to class that day. I'm going to take my absence. I'm going to call in sick on Ren 1 day. And I thought that was kind of a silly attitude to have. I mean, it's saying it's like these points can be very useful. You're basically saying that I'm not willing to help my patients because I think it's icky. And so I think it's, it's okay to have a, a, a professional attitude about... Um, those things. Sorry, I'm getting distracted. Al Alex says, I read somewhere that we should stay away from needling. The injured side is already weak, and needling weakens it more. I think it depends on the type of um, injury and what you're diagnosing um, and how you're treating it. So, so again, if it was like tennis elbow or something like that, I would, it, it's kind of like a lot of injuries I'm diagnosing as chi and blood stagnation. And so needling directly into that area um, disperses that chi and blood and helps with the healing process. If you go and read the book by Tim Bizio, A Tooth from the Tiger's Mouth, he talks about a lot about sports injuries, martial arts injuries, and the, the traditions that kind of came from Shaolin monks and martial artists. And for a lot of injuries, like his main treatment principle is bleeding cupping. So it's like if you have shoulder problems, you stab them until they bleed and stick a cup on it and suck the blood out if a person has this injury. And so to me, that that sounds a little bit extreme. Like if you're sucking the blood out, doesn't that weaken it even more? Um, but it's kind of like we're trying to disperse the chi and the, there's chi and blood stagnation. We're trying to disperse it so we can get new chi and blood forming in there. So I think it depends on the type of injury. I think there, like again, there are some things where I might not go directly into it. If that, uh, if it's weak or unstable, maybe I wouldn't go directly into it. I might go around it or things like that. But I think it's a case by case basis. Whereas most things, 
if the patient can tolerate needling locally, I, I would probably do it. Um, how 5 L one theory has been explained to me via treatment is tonify the mother and sedate the child. Oh, okay, yeah, this is, this is a little bit weird. Uh, yeah, I, th I think I understand what you're saying. And, th and this is a little bit weird, because sometimes in clinic people, be able, people talk about five-element five element acupuncture. Um, and what does that mean? And this is kind of like, to me, um, maybe an analogy for this is like when I was doing yoga, when I started doing yoga, I was doing yoga with an Indian, with a, with a monk. Uh, he actually wasn't Indian, but he trained in India. Um, but I did yoga with a guy who trained in India, and that, to me, that's what yoga was. And then when I got into American yoga, when it was skinny white girls wearing tight clothes and doing stretches in a hot room, uh, certain things were kind of confusing to me because that's what they thought yo yoga was. And so it was especially confusing when somebody said, oh, I do Ashtanga yoga. I was like, what do you mean you do Ashtanga yoga? Ashtanga Ash means eight, Tanga means limb. Ashtanga yoga is the eight-limbed yoga. It refers to Jama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayana, Pradihara, uh, Dharana, Dhyana, Samadhi. It's like there are eight limbs to yoga. Like, isn't all yoga Ashtanga yoga? What do you mean you do Ashtanga yoga? So about a year later, I realized what they meant is when they said, I do Ashtanga yoga, they meant I do Ashtanga Vinyasa yoga which is a specific style of yoga that was developed by Patabi Joyce in the 1940s. And so there was kind of, so that's to me, there was some confusion about, I thought Ashtanga yoga was this very broad concept and they thought Ashtanga yoga was this very specific style developed by this person. And so it's kind of the same thing when you say five element, it's like we have five phase theory, which permeates all of Chinese medicine. It's like everybody who does acupuncture incorporates some amount of five element or five phases. And then you have five element acupuncture, which was a style kind of codified by J.R. Worsley in, I don't remember when he lived, but it, it, relatively recently. Um, so when, so a lot of people when they say, I practice five element acupuncture, what they're referring to is this specific style by J that was brought to the West by J.R. Worsley. Um, I'm probably going to say a lot of things that are wrong here, and I'm probably going to say a lot of things that are going to upset five element ac practitioners because I don't, I don't know the full story. But um, my understanding is that uh, J.R. Worsley went to China and kind of did a tour of Asia. I think he went to China, Tibet, uh, Taiwan, Korea, and kind of explored acupuncture in these various areas. And so he found this particular style in one of these areas. I want to say it was Tibet, but that's probably wrong. He found a particular style and uh, he kind of, he learned that style really well and he brought it uh, to the West. But along that, along the way, he he learned other things that he that were not part of the style, but they were very useful to him. So he incorporated them into his style. So things like clearing blocks were not originally part of this system, but that's something he learned in Korea and he thought it was useful. So he incorporated that. So some people will say, "Oh, five element J.R. Worsley five element. That's just a modern modern made up style of acupuncture." Like, no, I think it's based on something very traditional. And. So when we say, so when they say uh, five element acupuncture, basically the idea is um, when we diagnose, when they diagnose a patient, they're diagnosing something they call a CF, a causative factor, and that is one of the five elements. The way you diagnose this, uh, you principally look at four things, color, odor, sound, and emotion. They're looking at the color of a, comp of a person's complexion. So if the person has a green complexion, they're a wood person. If a person has a yellow complexion, they're an earth person. If a person has a red complexion, they're a fire person. We look at the odor. You look for the five odors. And so each of the five phases has a smell associated with it, and they all sound pretty bad. Uh, they're like rancid, rotten, putrid. And so um, if a person has a, a, a rancid odor, they're uh, wood. If they have a burnt odor, they're fire. If they have a sweet odor, uh, they're earth. 
you listen to the sound of their voice. So each of the five phases has a sound associated with it, or sometimes they say a musical note. And so if a person has a sing-songy voice, that's an earth thing. If a person has a shouty voice, I think I have a very shouty voice, that's a wood person. Uh, if a person has a laughing voice or they laugh inappropriately, I remember on our uh, in school we had some intake forms and you would check a box if you had inappropriate laughter and nobody knew what that meant. People thought that you, you laughed every time someone said doo-doo. Really inappropriate laughter means like if something bad happens where normally you would be upset or angry but you laugh about it instead of crying, you laugh, that would be inappropriate laughter. Like. How's your day been going? <laughs> oh, it's been better, <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> That's like the, the laughter does not match the emotion or the situation. So that would be inappropriate laughter. Color, odor, sound, emotion, then, then the emotion of the person. If I always sound very angry, that's because I am. I'm an angry person. Um, if you have joy or lack of joy, that would be a fire thing, blah, blah, blah. So you, di you diagnose a CF based on those principles and then their point selection uh, usually they stick to the channel of the causative factor so if a person is a as a wood cf you would generally do points on the liver and gallbladder meridians but you might do some upper kidney points you might do some back shoe points you might do, do some dew points because those are still okay but you generally stick to um liver gallbladder points and they tend to use the name of the point as part of their as part of their treatment. So it's not just about altering the uh, affecting the chi dynamic, but it's like you have some upper upper points called a uh, hidden burial ground, and that's to help revive people when they feel. Anyway, they use the name of the points. That was a weird rant. What was I talking about? Five element style. So that's the thing is like a lot of, in clinic, a lot of people ask me, oh, what's five element style? Or they, they thought that five element style used a lot of um, four point needle technique. And that's not true. Those two things are completely different. Five element style is a style by J.R. Worsley. And um, we're doing something that's doing something a little bit different than just using like tonify the mother, sedate the child, things like that. So th those are kind of different. And so it's kind of a weird, confusing thing because those names can mean different things. But yeah, in, in th if you're asking specifically about um, the basic aspects of the five element style, um, in terms of if, you, if we mean specifically J.R. Worsley, five element, uh, style that I believe the school is now run by Neil. I forget his last name, but his name is Neil. That specific school, uh, yeah, it's basically, it's, it's a lot of treating the spirit. It's diagnosing a person based on the color, odor, sound, and emotion. And then when they use the points, where it's, it's about using the points, kind of the spirit aspect of the points and the, the names of the points become very important in that because the, the name of the point tells a story about what you're trying to treat. Uh, the title of the book, it was probably Web That Has No Weaver. It's probably one you're talking about. I'm always nervous typing things in because I don't know what's in my search history. Hopefully nothing inappropriate came up. Oh, I'm typing things and not showing you. The Web That Has No Weaver by Ted Kapchuk, I assume is what you're, well, what you're asking about. Yeah, The Web That Has No Weaver. Oh, let me get my buttons right. The web, Julia's on it, The Web That Has No Weaver. Oh, no, the one for sports injuries. Sorry, I'm a little bit behind on the chat. The one for sports injuries is Tooth From The Tiger's Mouth. Hope I don't have anything inappropriate on my uh, Amazon order history. What have I ordered recently? I think saws is all I've ordered. Oh yeah, here's sound equipment, YouTube stuff. Anyway, uh, Tooth from the Tiger's Mouth. Uh, powerful Secrets of the Great Chinese Warrior. Oh, I didn't I know, know it had that subtitle, but um, yeah, it's using, oh, sorry. Tooth from the Tiger's Mouth. Uh, how to treat injuries. Let's look inside. 
Um, it, so it kind of starts with a like a general overview of, of different treatment principles, but then it goes through different types of injuries. So it's very like it's it's like a user's manual. Sprains, strains, and pain. Um, oh, some has some advice on that. But then it's like how to treat cuts and lacerations. So cuts you can use Yunnan Bio, the stop bleeding thing, uh, cupping and bleeding, liniments, poultices and plasters, and so it has a lot of this stuff. And I feel like yeah, yeah, that's what this was. I was thinking the bulk of the book was it's how to treat different things. So you could just like use it like a user manual. Person comes in and they have a burn, it'll tell you what to do. If a person has hip pain, it'll kind of break it down and be like. Use this, um, use this tween ah, use these points, use this plaster, use this liniment. If a person has nosebleed, probably use Yunnan Bio or Qing Dai or something like that, San Chi. Um, if a person has frozen shoulder, uh, these are the points you can needle. Do, do cupping in this area or do bleeding cupping in this area. This is the type of manual therapy you should do. So it's a very... Um, uh, kind of like user manual for sports injuries. So, uh, but 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 more of a traditional one. When you get into the um, the other guy, that's mo that's more of a, a modern look at the muscles approach. I'm trying to think of who the other. I'm trying to think of the other guy's name. I met his son, but I can't think of the guy. Like his son was a student, and I can't think of his name now. But he wrote that huge textbook. That's really good. When are you going to plan to read some next point videos? Yeah, so I have um, Heart and SI are on the channel, uh, are on the website, I think. Let's see. Yeah, we have Heart video and we have Small Intestine video. Do I not have point location for those? Yeah, I do. I also have point location for those and point location for those. Um, I've been avoiding the other ones. I've been avoiding UB just because it's a long, annoying channel, so I might make something about that, um, both in terms of the theory and the point location. It's just a long, annoying channel. Um, and a lot of people have been asking me about that, both in the, the channel theory videos and in the point location videos. And basically, I'm kind of like... I might be focusing more on herbs for the next semester. I want to do so this this semester. I'm probably going to do some live streams. I think I'm instead of trying to make pre-recorded videos, I might just do live streams that are reviewing um, one category per week. So we can go through herbs one. Even though I already have a lot of herbs one material, I might go through and do one category. Then I might do like a single herb Saturday and a formula Friday. We can go through one uh, chapter of formulas, and that way. Um, I can put those on the formula review course, but but basically for the semester I might be focusing more on herbs rather than on acupuncture, and so a lot of people asking about that, and basically like I don't really feel too bad about it because like I'm glad that everybody finds those videos helpful, but I don't really feel too bad about it because I feel like if you just watch the lung channel video that gives you a pretty good outline of how to go about learning a channel that you start with what are the, the, the functions of the organ or of the channel, uh, the functions and characteristics. Then we look at the channel pathways. Where does the channel go? So like the lung channel goes to the throat. That should tell you something. Um, the lung channel also connects to the lung, large intestine, and the stomach. That should tell you something. So look at the channel pathways. Look at the, the, the secondary channel pathways. And then as you go through each point, as you go through the points, you can look at the functions of indications of the point and one, look at the functions of the organ and channel, look at the, um, the, the location or of the, the, the pathway of the channel, and then also look at the point category and try to make sense of how these functions and indications line up with those things. And so it's kind of like I laid that out very step by step in the lung channel you can kind of go ahead and do the same thing with the other channel. So if you're like, oh, the, the kidney. Well, the, uh, the kidney is the root of all yin and yang in the body, so there's probably a lot of tonify yin, tonify yang with those kidney points. 
what else does the kidney do? The kidney uh, belongs to the water element or the water phase, and so it has a lot to do with water metabolism. So when we look at kidney points, we're probably going to see a lot of water stuff like urination problems, edema in the legs. Um, a lot of the point names have water in them like Tai Shi, Great Stream, Fu Liu, Returning Current. They have a lot to do with water metabolism, especially in the lower body. The kidney governs the low back and knees, so we're probably going to see a lot of cold and sore knees, cold and weak low back. Um, what else does the kidney do? The emotion of the kidney is fear, so we have things like uh, kidney four, Da Jong, Great Bell. Kidney four is specifically for uh, the emotion of fear and things like that. So you can kind of go and look through those, uh, look through those things, and um, and kind of you can kind of do it yourself. I feel like at some point you don't really need me to do it for you. You can kind of do it yourself. You can be like, oh, kidney two. Uh, kidney two is the Ying Spring fire point. What do fire points do? They clear heat. Uh, what kind of heat comes in the kidney? Well, kidney usually have kidney yin deficiency causing heat. So kidney two is a yin spring fire point. It's really good for clearing heat from deficiency. In fact, the name of the point is Ranggu, Blazing Valley. And so that means it's really good for clearing heat. It even has fire in the name. So, so some of that stuff I think you can um, do yourself. Also, this is kind of like, I remember when I was teaching, uh, that's when I first made one of these uh, cheat sheets. And so I kind of handed these out to class as like just uh, this was meant to be like an example of this is how I organize the information. Some people are really into note cards and flashcards. I'm really into making little little sheets. And so I, I made a little sheet where I uh, put some of the basic info at the top about the channel pathways. Then we have a, a really uh, concise summary of the point locations. And then uh, we do some stuff with um, a point category and point function down there and that's the way I organize the information and so then all the students were like oh this is really helpful are you gonna make one of these for every channel I was like no you can make one yourself and that's kinda how you that, for me that's how I studied like making these cheat sheets was how I studied how I condensed the information and how I figured out what was important and what was not important so it was kinda like this is an example and then you can go through and make the others yourself so I guess that's kind of a mean way of putting it where it's it would be nicer if I just made the freaking video. So I'll do that eventually, but I have like 10 different things that I want to do and I'm also very lazy. So um, I'll just get to those. About channel differentiation, there, there are same symptoms in different categories of channel differentiating. Like hernia is a key symptom in the liver channel, but also in the REN channel. Yes, that's true. I would think it would depend on like, are we talking about like, if the hernia happens a little bit more on the on the lower abdomen versus in the inguinal crease? Because I like inguinal crease, I would think of the liver channel goes there. Uh, but yes, that's true, and so that's when we look at um, some of those channel symptoms. Sometimes, sometimes there is some overlap where like jaundice can be a spleen thing or a liver thing. And then sometimes there are like some, some surprising things that you don't really expect. Um, like a nasal congestion might be a large intestine channel thing or something like that. Sometimes it's like, where did that come from? Um, so yeah, that's kind of why you have to look at them all. Like, you can't just look at one. You have to look at the totality of the things and, and try to make sense of why it would be so yeah liver channel goes to the uh, goes to the inguinal area and wraps around the external genitalia and then goes up the side of the abdomen so it makes sense that hernia is like that ren channel starts at the genitals and goes up the lower abdomen so it also makes sense that hernia would be there but then we would differentiate maybe with other things where we, we would need like the whole story about is there like anger and a bitter taste in the mouth and um uh, tight and bound muscles or nodding of the sinews or things like that. So we'd have to look at the other things. Are there reproductive problems? I believe both of those channels encircle the lips as well. So that can be really confusing because the, the liver channel, like, like if you have problems like mouth sores around the, around the lips, so you, it could be a liver thing or a Ren channel thing or a Yang Ming thing. So, so sometimes we have to use the other signs and symptoms to differentiate that. So, but yeah, that's a good point. So it's kind of like, it's kind of annoying that you can't just memorize one thing. You have to look at the whole picture. 
What are we doing on that? Oh, it's been about 50 minutes. We can go a little bit more. So yeah, that was uh, the lady is a very nice lady. Her name is Tiffany. And I think someday I'll go back to, I've been trying to, I've been avoiding making point location videos because I don't like making point location videos, but maybe I'll uh, go back to San Diego and get Tiffany and Mallory to make some more videos. Zahra Love asks, is tonifying always a good thing since most people are assumed deficient? Everyone is running out of original cheese, so aren't we all necessarily in need of tonifying? Like, is qigong always a good thing? I'm unclear if this is correct or if we need to get a slightly better explanation of why this is true. Uh, when would, or exactly when would it be uh, contraindicated? Can the use of tonifying herbs be harmful? Uh, like in true excess, any advice? Yeah, so this is an interesting question. It's like, when it comes to like tonifying, it's like, why wouldn't you always tonify? Like why, like why wouldn't you always strengthen? Like, we're like can people have too much cheese? Like, oh, I have too much blood. I have too much energy. I'm too energetic. Why wouldn't you always just tonify? And it's also kind of interesting because some styles actually, like let me look at like Japanese style uh, practitioners, they, they do have this theory that everyone is deficient, that all disease is rooted in deficiency. So part of their treatment principle is always tonifying. But should we always tonify? And this is a question that was specifically on an herb video, the herbs that tonify chi video. And so it makes me think of a couple things. One of those things was I had a Chinese teacher who would, he liked to quote his Chinese teacher who said something like, everybody knows that futsa can kill a person. You know, futsa is aconite. In its raw form, it's very toxic. Even its, in its prepared form, it's still somewhat toxic. So he says, everybody knows that futsa can kill someone, but not everybody understands that renshen can also kill the patient, renshen being ginseng. And so kind of his point was that we have to use herbs appropriately. That's not just like toxic herbs at futsa that can be dangerous. Even herbs like ginseng, if they're used inappropriately, can also be dangerous to the patient so that we need, so that we need to be careful about how we use these herbs. And he did admit this is a little bit of an exaggeration. It's, it's a lot easier to kill someone with futsa. Killing someone with renshen is a little bit more difficult, but the, but the point still stands. Like, um, we had, there was one person in, in my school that, this was a, a, couple year, a couple years behind me, but I heard the story of someone in our school that they, they really wanted to have good chi, robust chi, be very energetic, and so they had Korean red ginseng tea every day and so they were taking this red ginseng every day and like you could kind of tell they were a little bit cracked out all the time that they were like uh real hyper they started getting bloodshot eyes and then one day he came and was like did you know i have high blood pressure like how do i i'm so healthy how do i have high blood pressure it's like because you're taking like red ginseng every day and so it turns out that red ginseng caused a lot of heat into a system and it actually caused problems where you think that, oh, if I take red ginseng every day, I'm gonna have robust chi and live forever. I'm like, no, you actually created too much heat and caused a lot of problems. Um, this also comes up when you talk about like qigong and martial arts. Sometimes people will make this point that it's a lot, especially a lot of young people are always like, oh, I need to cultivate chi, I need to tonify chi, I need to take all these chi tonics to build up my chi. And really, especially if you're younger, I think younger here means like less than 40 or certainly less than 30, you probably don't actually need to build chi. You probably just need to make sure that the chi that you have is circulating properly. So especially younger people, it might make more sense to focus more on circulating chi rather than cultivating chi. And so the type of qi gong you do might be different. Um, so you might be doing more move things that are focused on circulating chi through the uh, through movement rather than actually trying to draw in and cultivate chi. And certainly you would uh, take this into account with herbs and diet. And so like this is like a one qigong teacher who would say like like you'd get a lot of guys that like every time they like they would freak out when they had sex is like oh I just had sex I lost my jing I gotta go do some qigong right away. And actually no that's not good. If you do qigong right after you have sex it'll just cause like your qi to move more chaotically and stuff like that. So 
should we always tonify? Is it always bad? I think it, so to some extent, there are some people who say that all disease is rooted in deficiency. And it, it kind of makes sense that um, it's like if I caught a cold, you could say, oh, well, you know, if your lung chi was stronger, you would not have caught this cold in the first place. So, we, so to some extent, we could say, oh, yeah, if I caught a cold, uh, it's probably my lung chi wasn't as strong as it could have been. However, if I'm in the midst of an external attack, the treatment principle is not to tonify lung chi. The treatment principle is to fight off the pathogen and expel the pathogen. So unless I, have, I really have weak lung chi, I would not give tonifying herbs. I would give um, acrid dispersing herbs to disperse the pathogen. And so I think this, this it kind of depends on what you're treating, where it's, I, I guess you could say that with a lot of things. So if a person has a lot of dampness, you could say, oh, well, it's because their spleen is deficient, but maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but maybe you need to treat the excess condition first. So I think that um, if you're dealing, especially with older people, it's really common, like we have these things called spring wine, which is basically a bunch of tonics soaked in alcohol, and they take that every day as part of like a yang sheng thing. So I think especially if you're looking from a yang sheng nourishing your life point of view, then yeah, it's probably good to take to tonify. When you're dealing with a specific condition, then we need to look at more is it excess or deficient? And then we can look at the root and the branch. Are we treating the branch? Are we treating the root? Is it an uh, excess condition of the branch? Whereas the root causes deficiency, to what extent do we want to address the excess? Uh, to what extent do we want to tonify? Um, like one interesting example I like to use is the formula Ping Wei San. So let's look up Ping Wei San, calm the stomach powder. We'll look up Ping Wei San, American Dragon, because this guy has a really good website. So Ping Wei San is uh, for the stomach. It's good for dampness uh, in the middle jowl, and it's basically a bunch of aromatic herbs. So we see it has Tsangju, which is in the aromatic transform damp. It's Hu Pu, which is in the aromatic transform damp category. Chen Pi is in the regulate qi category, but it also has a bitter flavor that it dries out dampness. Jurgansau supports the middle. And so this is for dampness and um, disharmony of the stomach, cold damp in the spleen. Do we have signs and symptoms? But, what, but I think what's interesting is when we look at these signs and symptoms, we see things like fullness in the epigastrium, loss of taste, heavy sensation in the limbs, loose stools and diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, belching, acid reflux, lethargy, Increased desire to sleep, feeling lazy. So I feel like if mo if a, you had a patient come into the clinic with these signs and symptoms, most people would be like, oh, like say a patient comes in and says, I have fatigue, I'm lethargic, I have increased desire for sleep, uh, just low energy all around. And then you start asking questions about, oh, you have digestive problems, you have bloating after you're eating, you have loose stools. People would say, this person has spleen chi deficiency. And actually... Maybe they don't. Maybe they have excess dampness encumbering the spleen. So maybe we need to, instead of using tonifying formulas like Bujong Ichi Tong or uh, Liu Junzi Tong, maybe we need to use formulas like this that address the excess dampness, the aromatic to transform dampness. And so maybe this person maybe they really don't have a lot of under they don't actually have deficiency that needs to be tonified maybe they just have a diet that they are throwing so much dampness in onto their middle jowl that their middle jowl can't keep up and so the solution isn't to add more sweet herbs on top of it if you give them tonifying herbs you're just going to encumber the spleen even more what you need to do is give these draining herbs or these aromatic herbs to take care of the dampness to kind of relieve the strain on the spleen stomach. Um, so, I don't know. I think it depends. Should you always tonify? No. Um, another example I use is uh, I had a, a classmate in school that she had, she was having insomnia and um, 
kind of whenever people hear insomnia, they think, oh, Swanzo Rentong. So Swanzo Rentong is a tonifying formula. She took Swanzo Rentong and her insomnia got worse because her insomnia was due to liver excess. And so it turns out when you have liver excess and you tonify the liver, you make the condition worse. So for her, it was more about draining liver excess rather than tonifying. And so we could say that there was some way, somehow, something else was deficient. The read that this liver excess was created by some deficiency further down the line. But should you always tonify? I, I would say no. Um, maybe, again, maybe in a yang sheng, if you, when you get into your 40s and 50s, you should think about taking tonifying herbs just kind of like how you should moisture you should use moisturizer just as a preventative measure you should probably take a uh, tonifying herbs as a part of your yang sheng but should you always tonify eh, i wouldn't necessarily go I, I wouldn't think so again some people will say even ren shen can kill a person dear list do you have any banned herbs in the u.s sorry so like are you asking, like, are there certain herbs that are banned? Or are you saying that, like, there are banned herbs in the U.S. and do I currently have them in my cabinet? Um, actually, no. Now now I don't, I don't have an herbal pharmacy anymore, so I, I personally don't have any banned herbs. I do have a Fedrin, though. which is not banned in, in the format. So I'm not, I'm not sure what, what the ban on some of these herbs are because I feel like it's gone back and forth. There, there are a few herbs that have gone back and forth because I know for a long time we could not get Ma Huang, but I think lately I've seen some people with Ma Huang, so I'm not sure if they like loosen that restriction that if you get uh, Ma Huang in its, er, in its like raw herb form, then it's okay. Um, so I'm not sure what's going on with that. But I knew, do know for a while you couldn't get, get it from any of the suppliers, and I knew some people who were able to get it on eBay. Because it turns out if you just search Ma Huang, if you search the Chinese characters, it will come up. But then as it goes through customs, uh, it just says Chinese tea on it. So, uh, like, people at customs don't know what Ma Huang looks like, so they just like, oh, it's Chinese tea. It looks like a leaf, and they let it through. Um, so that might be one way to get it. I feel like there you run into the problem, like, if anything bad goes wrong, it's like you have no, like, you're shit out of luck, so. Um, what else? I, f I feel like Shi Xin was an um, Asarii Radix. I, think, I feel like Shi Xin was one for a long, for a while I thought we couldn't get it, and then I was at an herb shop and they had Shi Xin, and so I'm not sure if that's something that they, re they reversed their stance on that, because I think that was a thing that... When you look in Bensky, it's like it turns out shishin is toxic, but it's the leaves that are toxic. Whereas if you just use the root, the root is not toxic. So as long as you get the root, you don't have to worry about the aristolochic acid. Um, oh, uh, here we're talking more about animal hearts. Gujie and Lu Rong. Uh, as far as I know, those are not banned. So Gujie is like geckos are not endangered or anything like that. Um, so I currently don't have any good, that's one time I did make a, when we were talking about spring wine, one time I did, when I was in school, I made um, an alcohol that had a pair of geckos, because geckos you usually use a pair, a male and a female. And so when you like go to Mayway and buy them, they usually sell them in pairs. So I had a pair of geckos that I soaked in alcohol. Lu Rong um, is not very nice, but I think it's not banned. Um, Lu Rong is deer antler. It's not just deer antler, it's deer velvet. And so I think it comes from a younger deer. And I think it sounds not so bad. Like, oh, we're just harvesting the antler, but I'm pretty sure they're harvesting it at a level that I'm not sure the deer survives after you cut it off. And so you're trying to get like the blood. Um, it's kind of that essence that's in there. So you don't, it's not like you want like a, I don't go hunting, what do they call it? Like a four point buck, a 10 point buck. It's not like you want a big buck with, um, the large antlers that are already dried out because that's just like a uh, uh, fingernail tissue at that point. You want the part where it's growing, where it's just growing, where it has a lot of kind of like how a gecko's tail regenerates. You want the part of the, the antler that's regenerating and that gives you the jing. Um, so I feel like I'm not sure that you can actually harvest that from a deer and have the deer still be alive. So... Um, other ones that were banned for a while, I know Ujiao, um, 
black ass hide gelatin. I'd always get cool about that. Donkey gelatin, uh, jow. For a while, that was banned because I think that was a thing where they had some problems with the FDA where there's a certain type of donkey in Africa that is endangered, and there's a different type of donkey in China that is not endangered, but their names, their um, taxonomical, their not pharmaceutical. Their Latin names sound very similar. The, the species sounds very similar. So the U.S. was banning imports of it. And so I think some of the herb suppliers appealed to them and they said, no, this isn't this isn't an endangered donkey. This is the donkey that we have lots of. And so we were able to get the jow again. Um, what else? Uh, tiger bone. Tiger Bone is another banned one, and this is an interesting thing that if you look up, there's a very uh, famous uh, herbal wine called Hugu Mugwajo. Let's see if we can look that up. It comes in a very distinct bottle. Oh, maybe I don't. Oh, I thought I was able to find it before. Hugu. This is the bottle. So there's a very, this is a very famous, um, uh, Tongren Tong is a very famous herbal supplier. And so Hugu Muguajo is a, Hugu means tiger bone. And so this is a, 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 a traditional alcohol preparation that was very good for like chronic low back pain. Like when old people have back pain, it's like, oh, you used to use a tiger bone to strengthen it. And so um, tiger bone became illegal and so they changed the character so it doesn't, so this hugu, it still sounds like hugu, but the characters don't mean uh, tiger bone, it means something else. Anyway, officially, this, this alcohol does not include tiger bone, but I, I had a Chinese teacher who said that um, based on the reputation of uh, this company that they they have a very strong reputation of providing high quality ingredients and they 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 don't fake things that it's very likely that it's that it still has tiger bone in it so um that's something to look out for but no i don't have that i'm trying to think of what else would be banned rhinoceros horn bear gallbladder i don't, I don't have anything like that but yeah uh good Jian lu rong um I don't currently have those, but it's they're very they're very easy to find, and I have used those before. Uh, I've given those to patients before as well, um, and it worked really well. What else? I'm on the East Coast taking classes. I hope the East Coast is okay, because I think Ida got into New York, didn't it? Hope everything's going okay on the East Coast. Uh, do you have a clinic? No, since I moved to. Um, uh, I moved to Colorado in January, and I actually don't have a Colorado license yet. I haven't been seeing patients. I've just been doing online stuff. Or rather, I've been not doing online stuff. You know, there hasn't been much going on in the YouTube channel lately. So I haven't really been seeing patients, and so that's something I need to get on because I do want to see some patients. I don't like seeing a lot of patients. I don't really like, I was. I need to have a discussion about this on the podcast. Um, I don't really like the business side. Of treating patients, so I'm not really great at treating patients. Um, I think other people business has been going really well, but I've been I've been focusing more on educational things and online things rather than actually treating patients. Basically, when I treat patients, I like to treat patients for fun, which I understand is not a very good business model. But that's why I like to do other things so that I can uh, be like I'm treating patients for fun. That's why when I when I treat patients, I, I schedule them in 90-minute blocks because I like to sit around and hang out with my patients and just shoot the shit for half an hour. I don't want to have to worry about going from patient to patient. Um, and so that and that's also why I would do like massage a lot. If you, I do a combination of massage and acupuncture because massage, I'd be like, oh, I can just zone out for an hour and massage someone. Whereas, And then like the acupuncture, I can make sure I'm doing it for fun. So... Um, so I don't know. I guess that's not, that's not very like, that's not very inspiring to be like, I don't like, I don't like the business of acupuncture. Could you speak on latent heat and TCM? 
I think I would have to look that up. I would have to research that before I could say anything too profound. But we do sometimes talk about um, lingering heat or latent heat, and that sometimes it's... Um, could be something that like lingers after a febrile disease or it could just be heat buried. And we, we do have a, f a few formulas that are specifically for latent heat, like xie huang san, or actually a lot of our uh, drain the color decoctions are for latent heat. And it's kind of like, it's kind of weird and I haven't really seen a whole lot explaining it in a very good way, but they talk about lurking heat or latent heat or things like that. It's kind of lurking in the yin aspects of the body. And so... Um, I would want to do some more research before I say anything more profound about that and talk about things like Gao Huang Shu UB43, I think has some stuff to do with latent heat as well. Um, yeah, and so that this is kind of the thing where it's, yeah, that I don't have a very good business model where I, that's the thing, like if you go and look at the, um, like on the podcast, I did a podcast with uh, Lindsay, Lindsay Trottier, and she talked about how like she was like when she got into acupuncture, she was like, I want to make a shit ton of money. She was like in acupuncture to make money. And she talks about seeing like four or six patients an hour and, and, and having a busy clinic, running from room to room. And I think like if you want to do that, you can. There are ways to do that, and like get a front. You need to like get a front desk person and get an assistant, and then you're maximizing how many patients you can treat and how much money you have coming in. Then you get into the whole business of hiring people and hiring other people and training them. Um, Mark Brinson, the guy who makes Evil Bone Water, he's another person who's really good at this and has a lot of really good advice about setting up a clinic as a business. And I was just never really into that, so. Um, I just kind of like to do it for fun, which, I mean, sometimes that's why sometimes I would uh, uh, joke with Patrick about it, that um, he he's one of those people that he he's running a business, and he does very well at running a business, and I'd always kind of joke about that, where it's, he sees 60 or 80 patients a week, but he also drives a Mercedes-Benz AMG C63, and uh, has an 80-inch TV, whereas I'm driving a 2004 RAV4. Uh, here, for more on latent heat, look up Mark Nestrandria eLotus webinar, treating COVID with divergent channels webinar. Um, Yeah, so, yeah, because I, I feel like, the yeah, I would, I would have to look at more of that because I feel like we use different terms and I'm not entirely sure what the Chinese term here is because sometimes we talk about lurking heat, latent heat, lingering heat, and I'm not sure if lingering heat is the same thing or something different. And so this is that's one of those, it's like a term that pops up, but I've never really seen a good explanation of it, so I'd have to do a little bit more digging onto that before I, before I want to say something. Do I have more questions on my on my on my questions? So this was a good thing. Is like, should you when Zara was asking, should you always tonify? And that's different people have different opinions on that. But I would be careful about. You might be able to get away with that with acupuncture, and so especially uh, I think Japanese style uh, practitioners are always tonifying. They're always using back shoe points, and I think with acupuncture you can get away with that. With herbs, I would be much more careful about that. Should you always give people tonifying herbs? No, you can create problems, especially because ton that ton those tonifying herbs can cause stagnation. So that's why in a lot of our tonifying formulas, we also include moving things. So like with Bu Zhongichi Tong, it tonifies the spleen, but we include uh, Mu Xiang. Um, no, we include Chen Pi, Bu Zhang Yi Tong has Chen Pi, Gui Pi Tong has Mu Xiang, moving herbs to, to move. Um, even with our blood tonics, we throw in Chuan Xiang to make sure things are moving. So Su Wu Tong also has a moving aspect. So with herbs, I'd be very careful about always tonifying. But I've seen this have bad results when you tonify someone who with an excess condition. And that's another thing that sometimes people have problems with. They, they just like always want to tonify. They'll be like, oh, this person has this problem. We, oh, they're sick. Let's tonify their Wei Qi. It's like, no, don't do that. Like, oh, they have this thing. Well, if we, let's just give them 
uh, bajun tong, because certainly if we tonify chi and blood, that will make the person better. It doesn't always work like that. Love Jesus says, why when I eat chia seeds, my body feels cold? Question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. I don't know, bro. Sorry. I was told that Xiaoyang stage gallbladder alternates temperature from hot to cold to make the body environment too hostile to any bacteria or cold to survive. So I think this was a, a comment. We did a video going over the Shanghan Lun formulas. And this video is now part of the formula review course, but I did a live stream going over Shanghan Lun formula. So when we talk about Xiaoyang stage, we talked about alternating fever and chills. So Aneta is saying, I was told that Xiaoyang stage alternates temperature from hot to cold to make the body environment too hostile for bacteria or cold to survive. Um, that's interesting. I haven't heard that. Um, I'm kind of, like, honestly, I'm kind of skeptical about that just because uh, Zhong Zhongjing, you know, this was 2,000 years ago. Zhong Zhongjing didn't know about bacteria. Um, from a modern perspective, I have heard that uh, the fever is actually a physiological process, that it makes certain processes easier for the body, but it also makes it more, the, an increased temperature makes it more difficult for bacteria and viruses to survive or to replicate. So I have heard that from a strictly fever point of view. I'm not sure why alternating fever and chills would affect that, though. I've just heard that about fever, not necessarily alternating fever and chills. And when we talk about Shaoyang disorder, we're talking specifically about alternating fever and chills, whereas Taiyang, we would say simultaneous fever and chills, Yang Ming, just fever, Shaoyang, alternating fever and chills. And so that's an interesting idea. The way I've seen it explained in TCM terms is remember when we say Shaoyang, one of the Shaoyang channels is the gallbladder. And remember the gallbladder is prone to constraint or stagnation. And so that explanation of alternating fever and chills is that when the gallbladder gets constrained, the yang, the, the qi is no longer dispersing over the surface of the body. So we don't have that yang qi warming the surface or, the, or protecting the body's surface because of that constraint. So uh, it's very easy to get chilled. However, every once in a while that constraint, it builds up so much that it suddenly bursts and now you have this sudden burst of yang qi flowing over the body and you feel hot. And then it gets constrained so you feel cold and then it releases and uh, that release of qi you, it feels warm by comparison, so you feel hot. And so that alternating fever and chills more has to do with the constraint of the gallbladder. So I think that's the TCM explanation for that. Is that the last one? Do I have any more? Oh. Uh, Chris says, doesn't LI treat upper gum problems? Uh, according, strictly according to channel theory, the large intestine channel enters the lower gums, the stomach channel enters the upper gums. So one way to think about that is large intestine has an L in it, so it goes to the lower gums. Another way to think of it is the large intestine channel starts on the arm and goes up towards the face, so it's going to hit the lower gums first, whereas the stomach channel starts, uh, technically starts at LI20, but starts near the eye and comes down, comes down and splits, but it comes, it starts at the eye and comes down, so it's going to hit the upper gums first. So technically, if you're reading Deadman and you're looking at the channels, we would say that the large intestine channel enters the lower gums, the stomach channel enters the upper gums. The truth of the matter is nobody cares. If you're treating a gum problem, you're probably going to combine both large intestine and stomach points. You're probably going to use LI4 and stomach 44. Or if we go digging through uh, some theory on the points, I think it was Sun Tzu Miao said specific things like, LI3 is better for the lower gums, but LI10 is better from the upper gums. So when you look at the actual points, we could there is some there are some famous practitioners or famous doctors who say that you can treat both the upper and lower gums using points on the large intestine channel. But I believe um, I believe technically according to channel theory, we say the large intestine channel enters the lower gums, stomach channel enters the upper gums. In practice, who cares? Use LI4, stomach 44. Are meridians also located on the other side of the body, like right and left sides? Yes. 
Uh, this is something that I usually forget to point out when we're like in points one, just because it's, I've been doing this, like when you've been doing this for a while, it seems kind of obvious and you forget that it's not obvious to people who are just starting out, but all the channels are bilateral. With a possible exception of the stomach great wool channel, that one we say specifically exits below the left breast. But all the, all the primary channels are bilateral, so everything exists on the left and the right. So usually we just, just for simplicity, when we have a picture, we just draw it on one side. And sometimes it's really confusing because we'll, like, we'll draw part of the channel on one side, and then we'll draw another part of the channel on the other side. And that's just because we have to like draw it really weird. Like there, it's just hard to represent on a two-dimensional person. So we might have like, oh, the channel goes over here, but now it's over here. Does it switch sides? No, we just, all the channels are bilateral. We just draw them on one side. Boop, boop, ba -doo. So that's all the questions I had. I'm going to go look up this thing on, um, uh, for latent heat, I want to look that up because some people are saying like vaccines are like a form of latent heat, so that might be where that question came from. Um, I think it's just like heat linger, like that's lurking deeper in the body. She probably says, "Thank you for the herb review course. It was funny and fun. I'm glad people like it. Uh, let me know if you're if you mean the single herb because now there are two. There's a single herb review course and there's a formula review course. So let me know which one you think because I was actually thinking about re-recording the uh, single herb review course. So if we go to tcmstudy.net, let's go to resources, review courses. There's now two. There's a single herb review course that goes over all of the single herbs, and that's $40. There's a, a formula review course that's $49 that goes over all the formulas on the NCCOM list. So, so there are two review courses now. Um, this one, some of these videos are better than others, so I'm going to be re-recording some of these videos, but we do have practice tests. We have handouts and practice tests for each, each section. And there's also the, the single herb review course that goes over all the single herbs. And again, it has um, videos, video lectures, practice tests, and handouts for each category. It's, it's divided up in the third. So I might, I might reorganize this. I'm not, you probably can't even see this. What I'm trying to show you on my screen, you probably can't even see this. Um, but it goes through each, each category. But I might, I might break it up a little bit more. So I might redo this and, and break it up a little bit more. And I'm kind of sweaty and gross in a lot of those videos. So I might just do it just so I don't look quite so sweaty and gross. Oh, so, oh Shay did the, the single herb one. OK, awesome. Um, so that's good. I might I might redo some of this, and I might put the tests on my website rather than on this website because I don't really like Teachable's uh, test website. Um, so I'm glad that was helpful. I'm glad people are enjoying that, and so that we we might be doing more doing more herb review stuff this semester uh, and procrastinate on the acupuncture stuff. So. Part of that is because I, I make money by selling herb review courses, so if I promote the herb review courses, I'll actually be able to pay my rent, whereas if I um, acupuncture, I don't, I don't have any acupuncture, I just do for fun. Which therapy you use for yourself to pamper physical body after work as a massage therapist? Yeah, that was kind of a weird thing where like people are like, oh, do you ever get massage done on yourself? I'm like, no. Um, that's just, that's just me being weird. Um, so this is kind of a, I mean, one of these things is like, I know that a lot of people, uh, I've known a lot of people that massage is very, can be very difficult for them. It can be very physically demanding. And I guess like, I never really felt that way. I mean, I, I always make this joke that's like, I'm 200 pounds. If somebody wants deep tissue massage, I just kind of lean a little bit more on my elbow. So I, I, never really maybe i just didn't do enough of it but i never did enough massage to um that it actually uh drained me physically 
And that also could be that I kind of alternated massage and acupuncture, so I was never doing too much of one at a time. Um, but it is kind of funny. I do have a funny story of when I was in San Diego, I did um, a martial art called Bagua Jong. I'm not sure if anybody on here is a Bagua person because I think um, – I think Zachary Raid does Bagua, and there were some other people who did Bagua. Anyway, when I was in San Diego, I did a, uh, I was doing Bagua Jong for a while, eight trigram palm. And I remember there was this one guy who who was who uh, came to the classes. He was this very he was a large guy, huge guy, had a really deep voice. And so sometimes we'd do it in the park, and you'd see like just this big guy walking up. He was carrying a staff, and then he would turn around and set down this like pink Hello Kitty backpack. It was hilarious. Um, but he was he was a massage therapist, and so one time I was like, "Oh, how long have you been doing massage?" He's like, "I've been doing massage for 28 years." I'm like, "Oh, that's a long time," because a lot of people I know get burnt out on massage. They they don't they can only do it for a couple years, and they just get burnt out of the on. They have to do something else, and he was just like, "They don't know what I know. They don't train how I train. I do kung fu just to strengthen my grip. I don't use my elbows. You can't feel anything with your elbows. I do kung fu to strengthen my grip. Because when you walk through that door, you got to be strong from head to toe. A lot of these people, they just try to do yoga, and they think that's good enough. And so I thought that was funny. That was like, real, like you are a hardcore massage therapist. But... Um, but that was kind of funny. So that that was kind of his his thing was, and I, and I have noticed that that there are a lot of people that, um, I never really got tired doing massage. I we had a massage therapist in Kentucky, and one time I asked her about this, is like, do you ever get burnt out doing massage? And she was like, no. Uh, but it turns out she um, she did a lot of CrossFit bodybuilding type of stuff, and so it's like she was the kind of person who was deadlifting. 250, 300 pounds. So she was like, she was a very strong, well-built person. And because of that, she didn't get tired. And so I think that's kind of a, that's kind of a thing is kind of a yang sheng. You, it's hard to be like a very dainty person and um, not get burnt out on it. The other thing she did is she kind of switched over to doing um, a shiatsu. She did massage with, with her feet. And so then she was like, oh yeah, nowadays I just walk on people. So it's not, it's not very difficult at all. Um, so I know some people say things like every 10 massages, you need to get a massage for yourself or something like that. I've never really done that. Um, I have pretty good grip strength from all the, the lifting I do and stuff like that. So I've, I've never had a problem with it. Uh, I'm starting to lose my voice and get a headache, so we might have to end it pretty soon. We've been going for like an hour. I'm just trying to see if there are any more questions. If you have questions that I didn't get to, go ahead and leave them in the comment section here and we'll get to them next time. Or send me an email. Or um, if you're on the Patreon, leave it on one of the Patreon pages and I'll give you priority. Um, Ronald Del Mar is from Calgary. Hi in Calgary. Um, mm, 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 mm. Oh, here, the, I want to go back to this um, about channel differentiation, different symptoms. There's a follow-up of, does this have clinical value or is it just for exam purposes? Um, no, I would say it does have clinical value if you look at, if you look at it through the theory of channel theory. A lot of people, once they get into practice, they just, everything they learn kind of goes out the window. Either a lot of times what happens is either it's like you spent four years learning channel theory and then when they get to clinic, they're just going to be like, oh, I'm going to use ah sure points and use point prescriptions. Oh, I'm going to use Buddha's triangle, stuff like that. And they totally ignore channel theory. The other thing is a lot of people, like we try to teach channel theory, but when they get into the clinic, they just automatically default to Zong Fu theory. And sometimes that's because they just don't know the difference between Zong Fu theory and channel theory. So I think that if you're looking, if you want to be a good acupuncturist, um, I think on the podcast, uh, it, this is, I kind of had a, uh, an interesting conversation with Zachary Louis about um, 
how far do you want to go with acupuncture? Like if you really want to be an acupuncturist and really go deep into it, then I think learning those channel things is good and diagnosing according to channels. If you're an acupuncturist, you should be diagnosing according to channels, whereas herbs and maybe more zonkwu, but diagnosing according to channels can be good. And then some of those things can be good just in terms of knowing the things that seem weird or pop out. Because some things are obvious. So it's like when you got the lung channel is good for cough, that's kind of obvious. Um, some of the things are not so obvious. Um, so like spleen treating jaundice or things like that that we might not that you might not necessarily think of. And that can just give you some explanation. You can make some kind of uh, connection between what the points are doing and what the channel is doing. So hopefully the, those uh, channel indications can kind of bridge that gap of like, well, if this, if this point on the spleen channel treats jaundice, why does it do that? Well, then we can go and say, oh, it's because the channel goes, the channel indications is jaundice. And then we can say, oh, well, the spleen has something to do with damp heat. So that's how we connect the spleen to jaundice. I don't know. I'm, at this point, I'm rambling. But I would say hopefully, yes, it does have clinical value. The way a lot of practitioners approach it, maybe not so much. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll put a link to that on the website because that's the tooth from the tiger's mouth. I'll try to put a link to that on the website because that's that's actually a, a good book that I like. It's And it's very practical. It has, it has some good theory, and, but it's also very practical. Can someone who didn't grow up as a science person succeed in acupuncture? Yes. There's a good chance you'll be better at it than people who grew up as science people. Um, this is kind of an interesting thing that you hear sometimes that a lot of times um, when people who have like a nursing background or a Western medical background, people think, oh, those people have an advantage because they've been already been learning medicine. A lot of times people who are come in as nurses, it's actually more difficult for them to learn Chinese medicine just because it's so different. They have, they have a hard time stepping out of their Western frame of mind and going into a TCM frame of mind. So sometimes the non-science people actually do better. I think, I think especially with acupuncture, I think maybe herbal medicine is a little bit more deductive. And that's another thing we talked about with uh, Zachary Lee that uh, herbalists can be, can afford to be a little bit more in their head and mental and, um, use deductive reasoning in processes like that, whereas acupuncturists need to be in their body, they need to be palpating and feeling things. And so it's, and um, so that might, a non-science person might actually be better at acupuncture and physical therapy than a scientifically minded person. So I wouldn't let that hold you back. Um, this is also sometimes the thing we see when people come from the massage program into the acupuncture program. I feel like a lot of times, the massage students are weaker academically just because they're not used to the kind of academic rigor that we have in the acupuncture program. Um, so when it, when it comes to like memorizing things or making connections in a, a mental or a, in a, like an academic way, they're not as strong at that. But they have really good palpation skills just because they're used to working with bodies and having their hands on people. They have, you can tell that when people start needling, you can tell the difference between people who have had their hands on people and people who haven't. So uh, in, that, in that regard, they definitely have an advantage. So, so no, I don't think you need to be a, a scientific person. Uh, yeah, I think uh, doing Tai Chi, uh, we're, we're again going back to, um, helping your body out with massage. So yeah, I think, I think doing those types of things, um, uh, I think Tai Chi and Qigong are just good if you're doing acupuncture or massage. Sometimes I think of needling as more like Qigong, whereas doing massage is more like Tai Chi. So um, Tai Chi I think is especially good for proper body mechanics. You see, you see this a lot. I think I think massage therapists are better about this, but you see this a lot with acupuncturists. But they, they're like kneeling like this, or they're like contorting themselves in weird positions where it's like you need a good open stance to do things and to just not break your back after doing this eight hours a day. So I think Tai Chi is good for that, and just for like body mechanics. Think about think about like going into a horse or a bow stance next to the table and stuff like that, and uh, having those things that 
on the one hand, it opens up your chi a lot more, but it also protects your physical body. I think that's all I have for now. Because I'm running out of voice, I need to eat and go to the gym. Is today Friday? Today's Friday. So, um, thank you everyone for being here. As always, special thank you to the... Oh, I don't have a button for Patreon. Special thank you to the Patreon members for supporting the website. So, if you want to um, support, there are a couple ways you can do that. They're linked in the description below. One is to join the Patreon. Um, there's really nothing special about the about the joining the Patreon. Some people think there's like some extra extra stuff, and like no, there's really not. Really, it's my goal is to give away as much free as possible. And so, but just if you want to support that, uh, you can do that. Um, so the Patreon is kind of like a, a monthly donation. Other ways, uh, other possibilities are uh, in the link below. There's a link to a site buy me a coffee and so basically patreon is a monthly thing buy me a coffee is a one-time thing i think the buy me a coffee you have to do it in five dollar increments i don't know why sorry about that um so that's another way you can do it other ways you can do it is if you go to the website go to resources book recommendations and so here are some books. Basically, these are Amazon affiliate links. So if you buy any, if you click on one of these links and buy something through Amazon, they give me like four and a half percent. Um, so if you're getting your textbooks online, that that would be a way to do it that supports the channel. Also, if you just click on those links and then buy something completely unrelated to it, I think they still give me a percentage. So that's another way you can do uh, support the website at no additional cost to you. Again, there are review courses uh, for, for herbs, one for single herbs and one for herbal formulas. I have my P.O. Box address down there. Some people just wanted to send me things. So if you want to send me things, send me some Halloween candy at the P.O. Box in Broomfield, Colorado. I think that's about it. Um, coming up here, what we're going to be doing, what I want to be doing is I think my school starts, some people are starting school this week, some people are starting school next week, so what I was thinking is uh, maybe not next week but the week after doing regular live streams. Instead of doing Q&As, we might do one live stream that reviews uh, a single herb category and then do another live stream that reviews a formula category. And so we might focus on uh, herbs a little bit more in this next semester. And oh, another thing I'm doing is uh, I'm playing around with making flashcards. What am I, I'm getting my buttons mixed up. And so um, this is some people were, um, I saw some people that were, they were printing out my slides and then cutting them up apart into flashcards. So I'm making some stuff that's meant to be printed out on four by six flashcards. There's going to be a couple versions. I think one is just going to be black and white without the picture, depending on how much printer ink you want to use. We can have one that's just black and white, one that has a color photo of the herb. And then I may, might make one version that has like these little annotations on it. So it'll tell you what the Chinese means. It'll have some emojis on there to help you and I'll have some stuff underlined. So I, I released the, the first category of that in the um, on the Patreon. So if you're a member of the Patreon, there should be a post on the Patreon page that you can download that. Let me know if that works out for you and I might keep doing that and making those for every category. Um, just because. I think that's it. Have a good weekend. We'll see you next time. Probably not next, what's, what day is it? Probably not next week. Um, oh, so this is the other thing I should say as, as part of my thanking the Patreon members. So um, lately I've been uh, doing a lot of volunteer work for a um, disaster relief organization called Team Rubicon. In Colorado, what that means is we're doing a lot of fire mitigation. That is where um, cutting down trees so that they don't catch on fire and spread wildfire. So that's a lot. We've been doing fire mitigation. They've been doing stuff with COVID. Uh, recently, one of the things they've been doing is helping resettle uh, families from Afghanistan that have been coming to America. So I've been doing some of that, helping moving people. And there's probably going to be a lot more coming up that they're getting involved in uh, Hurricane Ida and the relief efforts there. 
And so basically over the last several months, I've been doing uh, more with them. And so that's why I'm especially appreciative to the, the Patreon members and the people who buy the courses that basically that allows me to have a flexible schedule that when I want, I can run off into to the woods and help prevent forest fires or I can help uh, families move into their houses or things like that. So I'm really appreciative of the uh, Patreon members and the people who buy uh, courses that supports me and allows me to do those those volunteer things and um, oh so basically I think I think I'm going up to uh, I'm gonna go uh, cut down some trees next weekend so we won't be we won't be doing a live stream the weekend of September 11th uh, but after that we'll probably start doing some herb reviews stuff so maybe we'll try to throw in some Q&A's in there but then we'll also throw in um, do some more herb review stuff with some note with some flashcards and stuff like that have you noticed any practitioners using acupuncture for pur purely psycho-emotional traumas yes um, uh, maybe go to the podcast and sorry oh too many buttons look up the one on um, with Natalie Vale because Natalie Vale is she does acupuncture but she's also uh, she does a lot of feng shui stuff she does a lot of uh, psychic stuff um, so she does a lot of uh, um, mental emotional things I have a friend here in Denver uh, Keiko Jaco Berenger, she uh, specializes in emotional issues uh, as well, so I wanted to do a podcast with her at some point. But yeah, there are some people who, who just do emotional things. That's a very common thing. Um, and so I kind of wanted to talk to her about some of her uh, her treatment strategies for that because I've, I've talked to a lot of people who do more sports injury stuff. I want to I wanna see about some of her treatment strategies, so hopefully I'll get her on the on the podcast She's always out skiing, so I need to make sure it's not skiing season. That's all. Thank you. If you want to support the website, there's there's links in the description below. Uh, I won't see you next week because I'm going to be uh, in the mountains cutting down trees. But uh, starting the week after that, I'll, we'll start doing some more live streams, and hopefully I'll get some more content up on the website and actually get back to work. So... Um, uh, we'll be announcing that on the Facebook page and on the Instagram page. So that's the place to look for that. So that's it. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next time.